Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of White Pod. My name is Parishir and I'm the director of business alliances at White Labs. We are a digital agency specializing in SaaS and e-commerce this year. I've got Marnik Sunil with me today. He's the founder and CEO of Therma. Now Therma is a technology company whose mission is to protect our food, health and our planet. A big welcome to you, Marnik. I'm so happy to have you with me today. Pleasure to be here, Harshit. Thanks for having me. Great. Uh, now, Vani, you have had an interesting journey, even before Tom, how uh, Gavin and Slav, that we co-founded. Can you please start by telling our audience about your professional journey? So. It's definitely a, uh, a, a twisting and winding road, <laughs> but I think life sometimes makes sense in the rear view mirror. You don't always know where the road's taking you. I started out my career in private equity and investing at a big hedge PE fund called D.E. Shaw. I was there for about four years in 2006, working on emerging markets and living partly in Asia. I lived in China and India for three years, uh, investing on the ground. Decided to go back to my origins and my kind of roots in public policy and my interest in, in government and uh, impact. I went to work in the White House uh, in the Obama administration as a junior guy on the economic policy team uh, and went back to law school uh, in between. Uh, and, and got a law degree. So I think that was a, the first twist in the road. And the second twist was I was in government. I met a woman there. She was the deputy CTO in the first Obama White House. And she had also gone to law school and taught herself how to write code. Beth Novick. Uh, she convinced me that there was a huge opportunity to build tech around public problems, uh, civic technology, as, as we called it. And, and that there was an opportunity to, to use the power of product and, and technology to do good and do well. And so I joined her, left government, and started a center at MIT and NYU called the Governance Lab, or GovLab, focused on tech for good, it raised about $20 million of grant funding for that center, and uh, did that for a couple of years as a do tank. So that's how I got into technology. And then a couple of years later, I decided to become an entrepreneur and took the plunge and started working on problems around safety and sustainability in the food industry, which is close to my home and close to my origins. I I grew up in an ag town called Fresno in the Central Valley of California, halfway between LA and San Francisco, was trying to figure out where safety and sustainability problems could be solved with tech, discovered that the farm to fork supply chain was broken in many ways, had lots of problems and we're using technology from the 1950s, even though it's only an hour away from Silicon Valley. But that's how I got into the food kind of food supply chain and farm to fork and, and started a business called Co-Inspect, which pivoted and became Therma. And the rest is history, or just getting going. Yeah, uh, I think that this transition happened in 2019, I believe, right? It did. It did. It was a kind of pivot. Uh, you know, when you're in the middle, when you're in the middle of a pivot, you don't realize you're pivoting. You're just trying to figure out what you're doing. And so we were growing this product called Collaborative Inspect, Co-Inspect. We had uh, grown it to about 5,000 users, uh, and uh, it was a fast product replacing physical manual workflow in the food industry that was being done on a clipboard, a kind of a paper clipboard with mobile apps that can use timestamps, geolocation and photos to get better data, more accurate, and then to use legal requirements to guarantee safety and quality on the back end. What turned out most of what people were checking was temperature, the temperature around the product and the temperature around perishables. That was a key, key endpoint that needs to be monitored, both for safety and for preventing food loss and food waste. And so we started thinking, we're just replacing a piece of paper with a digital clipboard. People still have to check this four to eight times a day. That doesn't seem like a great solution. That's like incremental at best. How can we do a better job? And that's what led us to automation and, and opened up the possibility of using sensors as a better way of solving the problem. And that insight that we could automate the work entirely got us thinking about new types of connect and led to us discovering that radio, long-range radio-based sensors work really well for refrigeration and getting signal out of the inside of a fridge or a freezer out. And that's how Thermo was born. Brilliant, man. Uh, now let's talk about like, uh, accomplishments of Thermo that you're most proud of and how do they contribute to your company's mission of combating climate change? Sure. I think that the reason I got into tech was to build tech around safety and sustainability and, and problems that, that I thought the, the current set of solutions wasn't tackling. Like I was interested in building tech for good, but to do that, you first have to solve a real user problem or create ROI for your customer. And with Thermo, what we were able to do was align the user incentive 
with the customer incentive. And in doing that, the social benefit came out of it. So with the user, what we're doing is we're replacing a manual workflow that takes five to 10 minutes, four times a day with automation. So it's literally saving them time on task and reducing back of house workflow. For the customer, which is typically an owner operator of a business in the food industry, a restaurant, a convenience store, uh, a grocer, a distributor, we're giving them real-time visibility into their equipment, particularly equipment that stores thousands or tens of thousands of dollars of product. And we can catch equipment issues early and often. We can prevent food loss and reduce the chance of spoilage and shrink. So it's like an alarm or insurance uh, provides them peace of mind. And there's ROI around that. There's dollars. By doing that, by catching issues in the equipment and preventing food loss, we're reducing the amount of refrigerants that are leaking from these devices. And we're reducing the food wasted, uh, which is a big source of emissions. Both of those are big drivers of emissions. And so the social impact, emissions reduction, is a byproduct of saving businesses money and making life easier for managers and, and employees. Makes sense. And if you have to pick, because you know, it's still a competitive space that you're in, if you have to pick one specific USP of Thermal, what would that be? Yeah, I would say. Let close to your heart. We are the most reliable, most user friendly or consumer grade product in the category. So it's a drop in place, do it yourself, you're up and running in 10 minutes kind of product, which makes it accessible to small businesses and large businesses with um, high turnover in the back of house. It's just a very consumer grade, light and simple offering. I think that's really our, our differentiator. There's a lot of technology underlying that, but essentially I think that's in a nutshell. And because you know, Thelma is to major brands, McDonald's, 7 Eleven, so on and so forth. Uh, what lessons uh, can other businesses basically learn from these collaboration of your company with these big brands? I think that one of the things we learned early on is you have to match the ambition to the stage of the business. We tried going after corporate accounts early, oh. but we didn't have the product or the sales and marketing resources to really meet the customer where they were. And the requirements were often way more significant than what we could handle. And the sales cycle was often much longer than our team or our capital supported. And so that is a mismatch. What we started doing with Therma, that was with Coinspec. What we started doing with Therma was going from selling or trying to sell to the corporate owner to targeting the franchisees. And the franchisees are often smaller they're uh, quicker to adopt new technology. They test and they iterate a lot more. And so with franchisees, because they're smaller companies and because they're more nimble, we were able to get faster validation and we were able to get faster deals closed. And so we picked up many more accounts. And in doing that, we were able to improve the product, continuously get feedback from the same operators, McDonald's, whether it's owned by corporate or a franchisee, similar operations, similar footprint. But we were able to get a lot more uh, traction in a short amount of time. And that revenue and the logos helped us eventually raise more capital, which has then allowed us to go back to the corporate buyers and say, hey, we'd love to work with you now. And now we work with operators of Taco Bell and Pizza Hut and Domino's, Marriott, Wyndham, Hilton, 7-Eleven, a bunch of other brands. But the, the sequencing is key. Going after enterprise accounts early, unless we have a very clear idea of how to meet their requirements and if you have the capital to support a long sales cycle is pretty challenging for an early stage startup yeah makes sense right uh, now because we talked about your marketing i would love to understand like what specific strategies have been really fruitful and what specific channels have been most profitable in that sense sure i think the the marketing playbook that we're running is a combination of a few different channel strategies so first we have a, a kind of traditional, if you will, product marketing team. Traditional in the sense that our product marketing team is really focused on sales enablement. Our sales channel is a direct B2B sales motion. So we have account executives doing inside sales, supported by business development representatives, BDRs, qualifying and generating leads. So that motion, which requires people to talk to other people, means you have to have collateral and, and materials. So we have case studies, ROI calculators, decks and teasers. 
all of that collateral is provided by our product marketing team. That's really kind of sales enablement, sales support. That's our primary growth channel. Additionally, we have a, a team that's working on inbound. And that team we think of as growth marketing. And some people think of it or describe it as demand generation. We're using a combination of SEO, SEM, ad buys to drive traffic to a series of landing pages. We use those landing pages to bring warm marketing qualified leads to a decision. That decision could be talk to another person on the team for a larger account, uh, for a larger deal, or uh, self-purchase. So we have an e-commerce uh, channel where you can go in and buy our product online. It's a smaller portion of our revenue base, but considerable. Still a, a considerable portion of our revenue comes from e-com. And so demand generation is largely supporting that channel, a B2B e-com approach. And then we have a PR and comms marketing team. And their objective is really to raise the profile of the company, to help us get into the right room, to help us get into the right conversations. They're elevating the vision and the mission and the profile of the business. And that's both, the, both in service of attracting human and financial capital. There, we're really trying to position ourselves as an early innovator and a leader in an emerging category around cooling and climate. And so those are the three marketing efforts, product marketing, growth marketing, and then PR comes. Gotcha. gotcha. And any notable challenge that you would like to highlight with respect to the marketing side that you have basically surpassed, overcome recently or in the last couple of years? Yeah, I think there's always uh, challenges. And I think we're working through many different issues early stage. But I think one of the biggest challenges early on is figuring out you know, who your ideal customer profile is or who you're selling to, who wants what you're building. And as that, as that question gets answered or gets you, as one gets more clarity around that question, then I think a related question is how to reach those ideal customers as efficiently as possible. That becomes a secondary, but also a very important question to get to scale. So those are, I think, two areas we've had uh, lots of learnings and lots of growth. And one is who actually wants what we're building? There's a lot of refrigeration and cooling in the world, like yeah. 200 million units in every country in 10 verticals. So figuring out whether we should be working with blood banks or pharmacies or clinics or hospitals or food service uh, establishments was an early challenge. It was particularly hard because we launched Therma at the end of 2019 and about three or four months into launching, we had a global pandemic that shut the entire world down for almost two years. So that made it really hard to do customer development and, and talk to people. So we had to rely a lot on marketing. And particularly, we use a lot of uh, testing uh, online. Uh, we did a lot of campaign work online to try and figure out who might want this early product we were building. And those campaigns and that testing exposed uh, latent demand. It exposed interest in certain segments and in verticals. And those learnings turned into our go-to-market strategy, which then we applied more capital and more bodies behind with the direct sales effort. But the learnings came largely from campaigns and, and efforts we were running online in 2020 and 21, when you couldn't go in person to meet and interview people. Gotcha. All right. Uh, now, because as someone deeply committed to innovation for social impact, uh, how do you balance the need for technological innovation with the broader goal of creating a more sustainable planet? I think that there's a there's an order of of operations to doing it well. I think that as a colleague of mine said a decade ago to me, a successful entrepreneur who's had a couple of significant exits, if you want to change the world, you must first accept it. And so I think that understanding incentive, what exactly is driving adoption of your product or products is key. If you can understand what is motivating users and customers, then one can, can work with that and often align with those incentives in such a way that the products one builds have positive social impact. But if you try and uh, build a product that has positive social impact, but it doesn't solve the user, a user's problems or, or generate ROI for a customer, whether it's um, saving them money or making them more money, uh, or, or providing them with peace of mind or what have you, if you don't provide value to the user and the customer in a measurable, quantifiable way, 
it doesn't really matter how socially impactful your product is. It's going to be super hard to get any traction. It's going to be super hard to get anyone to adopt it. And so you're not going to get much social impact. That's the thing I would say I've continued to appreciate about tech and, and technology products. With a product, you're basically relying on a user and on customers to adopt and, and scale your intervention. In a previous life, I was in government and as a legislator or as a regulator, uh, you can make people do the right thing. You can make people do what you think is good for society. You pass legislation, you pass regulation. Those are ways to make people do what you think is right, uh, even if they don't want to do it, even if it's not in their interest or their incentive. But with a tech product, if you just want people to do the right thing, but your product doesn't solve a problem or make their life better in some way, it's very hard to scale. And so I think the best social way, the way, the best way to have social impact as a technology entrepreneur with products and services is find user problems and customer problems that you can solve, but solve it in a way that has a positive social impact built in. And so for us, we reduce businesses costs around labor and food and also energy. All of those are things businesses care about. And they care about a lot right now because inflation is high and there's a lot of pressure on, on margin. But we happen to do it in ways that also reduce emissions in a quantifiable way. And that's an additional benefit of the solution, but not the reason necessarily why they're buying. Tell me one more thing. What role does the user feedback plays in your organization for the product development side of things? And like, what exactly is the process for you to monitor and incorporate that feedback with your product development? Like how that process looks like? Yeah, I think that we've developed, I think, a more robust approach to product development over the years. Early on, when we were getting started, when the company was two people, the user feedback and the product development process was embedded into sales and success and, frankly, business development as well. It was your, the same person was getting all those inputs and trying to figure out how to parse that for both selling and also building at the same time. We have now a more established product team that uses a combination of structured and unstructured inputs. So we do user interviews um, every month. We provide um, surveys and embedded questionnaires into our products and into some of our marketing, product marketing materials to get input on various dimensions of the product. Sometimes it's inputs on new features. Sometimes it's input on the product overall. Sometimes it's inputs on potential gaps in the solution that might be valuable to add. We also have a, a kind of a very strong feedback mechanism between our revenue team and our product team. So revenue is talking to the customer and potential customer all day long. That's um, sales development reps, account executives, customer success managers, and customer support managers. All of those roles are talking to the market, talking to users and customers. Uh, so we have a, a set of processes and, and tools internally for structuring that input and, and those ideas and some of that feedback and then distilling it. We use a combination of some boards uh, and some, some kind of off the shelf tools, third-party developed tools for structuring that input and then making it available to the product team. And then lastly, we do a fair bit of direct uh, user observation. So we'll actually send out our product team to watch users interacting with our product, talk to customers and do field surveys, field interviews and observations. And, and that helps provide some more rich context around our products and, and how users are interacting with them. That's brilliant. Um, okay, Malik, uh, with respect to the customer retention side, uh, you have any specific strategy or program that you have launched uh, that has done wonders for the organization? Anything on that? Uh, uh, you know, could, could you put some light on that area? And also, how exactly is the churn rate? In the organization. For sure. Uh, when you say the churn rate in the organization, you mean retention within the team? Uh, not within the team, but with the customers. With the customer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We've been fortunate, I think, that despite launching early on in the pandemic, we were able to, to provide value to customers uh, that became more important during the pandemic and after. So the, the core value drivers of our solution include providing visibility into the equipment and the inventory inside, and then reducing costs around food and energy. Uh, those uh, became more important during 2020 and 2021 when customers had to shut locations temporarily, 
when they had to have less staffing because of labor shortages and tightness and because guests weren't coming as often. Uh, we sell to restaurants, hospitality, and food retail uh, companies. So a lot of those businesses had tight staffing and limited hours of oversight. So they wanted more visibility and more data coming from their boxes. And so our products did really well. And so we grew rapidly during the pandemic. After the pandemic, the dust settled, so to speak, because inflation and labor and energy costs are high, people have continued to want products like ours. And, and there's more and more pressure to run businesses tight because these margin challenges have not gotten easier in 22 or 23. And so we have almost no churn. We've got around 3% churn on our customer base of over 1,100 customers. And we have net revenue retention that's over 110%. So a good amount of expansion from our customers. We're thrilled about those numbers. Yeah, that's brilliant, actually. And any specific program or strategy that really helped you achieve these numbers? It definitely helps to have, I think, really tight feedback loops between the user and customer and, 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 and what, you're, what you're building. I think having a better product development process with tighter feedback loops has made us more, more rigorous and, and more effective in building features that create value for the user and create value for the customer. As a simple example, much of our reporting from Therma came directly from customer development and user interviews around what types of data would best be served and in what format they could best be surfaced to the, the user. And so most of our reporting and reporting features are directly taken from customers' uh, inputs. Uh, similarly, our prediction around equipment failure, that's a product feature we offer, that feature has come very much informed by the user uh, input and, and user inputs over the last few years. So those kinds of changes, adding a reporting uh, module, adding predictive insights, Building features like that are responsive to customer needs helps drive value. And we do that because we're a SaaS company, the product is always uh, being evaluated, right? A customer could churn anytime. You can cancel if you don't like the value creation. So we're constantly working to improve it and, and still providing value every week, every month. Iterating and adding based on customer feedback, I think has been one of the most powerful ways to maintain a customer that's happy and, and, and lower the churn. And, and the last thing I'll say is having a tight process of supporting uh, unhappy customers. So we're pretty customer friendly, I would say. We have at this point 24 seven customer support, which is unusual for a company of our size. That allows people to talk to a human at any time, including like late night on a Saturday night. A lot of our customers work nights and weekends, restaurants, hotels, they need to have issues resolved and at times when traditional businesses are closed, providing that high touch, customer support and being willing to do things like ship out replacement sensors, the batteries are dead, covering the costs of, of return. Those types of features on the support side make for, I think, better customer experience and drive retention as well. That's brilliant, Manik. And also, you know what, there's a challenge when you are customer centric, and that's a good thing to be honest, but when you want to take your customer feedback way too seriously, definitely there are a lot of requests, feature requests and all, coming from multiple customer base of yours. And then selecting or entertaining a feature request uh, that could be served to the wider audience. And that selection process becomes a challenge, right? Have you faced something similar in your organization? And if so, how do you address it? Yeah, let me see if I understood you, Harshit. When you say selecting that selection process, do you mean finding the ideal customer within no, a no. possible? So say for example, you're serving thousand people, okay? The, out of those thousand people, 500 people have come back to you with some of the other add-on thing or feature requests, those things, and then might be unique and, and unique for their own business, uh, but might not be served for a wider range of audience that you to. So how exactly that selection and that scrutiny happens? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the, the reality is it's always a judgment call and knowing whose input to listen to at any given time when you have a lot of sources of input is hard. Mm -hmm. I think that's why doing product development well is often it's as much art as it is science. I think part of the exercise is having a strategic view on where you're taking your business. What kind of business are you building? What types of products and services do you want to develop over time? Part of it is maintaining a sense of 
a vision and internal direction, that can be a filter because that can take some ideas that come from the market or come from users off the table. You may say, sure, we got X number of people saying we want this, but the kind of direction that we're taking the company, this request or this set of inputs doesn't really fit. And so we're not going to go and do that, for instance. That's a general point. It depends on the specifics. The other thing I think the other uh, filter is to be looking out for, I think people have described this with different metaphors, but I think to be looking out for whether a set of requests or inputs falls into the nice to have or the need to have bucket. There's lots of nice to have features, and then there is some need to have. And being able to figure out like what's vitamin, nice to have, versus what's pill, need to have. That's a really, I think, effective way to prioritize what to build, because there's many things that could go into a fully featured product or platform. But the art is knowing which things you have to build in the short term to get more traction and opportunity so you can build some of the nice to have features later on. And so listening with a close ear to those inputs and reading or listening closely to figure out whether those inputs are falling into the nice to have or the need to have back bucket is another, I think, important filter. That's why it's great. Okay, for well, climate positive solutions, how do we leverage thought leaders shift to basically raise awareness and drive positive change in the industry? Yeah, we are doing some things in the product as well. So I can talk about those. But outside of the, the, the product itself, um, we are... Uh, participating in and engaging with the kind of climate innovation community at multiple levels. Um, we attend a number of meetups, conferences, retreats um, uh, that are around the themes of energy optimization, food waste reduction, and climate innovation. So I think being in the room and telling the story uh, and finding like-minded partners is is part of it. And that sometimes opens up opportunity. Because we were doing some of that in 2019, we got invited to a hardware climate accelerator in Brooklyn run by BMW uh, and Urban Us called Urban X. That allowed us to build hardware. It opened up opportunity. Um, conversations like we were having with some of these kinds of stakeholders opened up opportunity with government loans and, and grant programs that we've been pursuing recently. It certainly helps with um, raising the profile of the business. And I would say half of our leadership team uh, joined the company because they reached out to me inbound, cold, on email or LinkedIn over the last four or five years, just hearing about our work on a podcast or in an article or some talk I gave. Those efforts to be in the room and to tell the story, they're not just to sound, to, to fill the time. The goal is really to unlock opportunities, to build the team, to attract resources, to get more like-minded innovators to care. And beyond attending and, and joining and participating in, in these kinds of events, we're starting to do more writing and speaking in a formal way around these themes. So trying to get the word out in a more structured format, which is something I'm taking on this year in a bigger way. I'm great to see the future trends in energy management and sustainability and how is positioning itself to capitalize on these trends. Yeah, I think that we're seeing a lot of interest in the kind of energy efficiency, energy optimization, and built environment transformation space, those spaces. Uh, huge amount of capital uh, being deployed around these themes. And that's partly because there's a lot of social and economic cost at stake. We need uh, to use less energy and we need to use cleaner sources or forms of energy. That's very clear. Uh, the math is unequivocal, and many people talk about it every day now. Given that we have a huge amount of a gap today between the need for cleaner and more efficient energy and what is out there, there's essentially more people and capital looking for solutions then there are capital, then there are solutions available at scale to deploy that capital behind. So I think lots of ways to answer your question, but uh, we're seeing a lot more early stage capital, I think, going into the energy innovation environment and themes around energy efficiency, energy optimization, a built environment transformation. We're seeing later stage capital going into these. We're seeing government funding. Look at the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, as just one 
instance of tens of billions of dollars of government subsidy to accelerate this transition. We're seeing thousands of people moving into these industries uh, every year, uh, which is great. <laughs> we need more people working on the solution. And I think you're going to hear about it in the news more and more uh, with energy prices rising and energy being increasingly uh, premium and geopolitical tensions. I think the next decade, we're going to see a lot more in the news around um, how can we do better in terms of generating, distributing, and, and using energy, and how can we get cleaner uh, in, in, in energy, the value chain. So I think there's a lot of uh, political uh, interest as well in, in, in getting this right, both because of the geopolitics and because of the social and economic consequences. Makes sense. All right, Mike. So we're coming to an end, and I would love to have a quick rapid fire with you. Let's make this a fun session. Okay. Are you ready for that? Sure. Okay. If given a superpower, what will you choose? Would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to talk to animals? Talk to animals. I think I want to know their view on everything. <laughs> If you were traveling back in time, what period would you go to? The the Homeric era, the kind of Greco, the kind of ancient Greece into the kind of classical antiquity. I think there was just so much fundamental ideation about the human existence in that period and just so many interesting people and stories that came out of it that we still talk about 3,000 years later. Uh, okay, what's the fastest speed you have ever driven in a car? Miles an hour. Going down the highway, uh, we were in Napa coming out of the wildfires in 2017, my wife and I. We had gone for an anniversary trip, and uh, we got caught. Our first night was the first night of the worst wildfire in California history, and it was just starting. It lasted for several days. We woke up in the middle of the night, and the hotel uh, innkeeper said, hey, look out your window. There was orange flares everywhere in the distance. And at the time, the innkeeper said, okay, everyone in the hotel, we're going to have you collect around the pool. And we want you to jump into the pool um, in case the fire hits the hotel. And my wife was like, no way. Uh, I'm getting out of here. We're going to get in the car and drive back. We live in San Francisco in the city an hour and 20 minutes away. And so we just, we drove faster than I've ever driven out of that small town with fire on both sides of the highway around us. It was just very scary. Okay. How it many, was intense. Yeah. How many hours of sleep do you need? Too many. <laughs> Seven and a half, I'd say, is my sweet spot. Okay. Now, maybe your very last question. What's your last Google search? Best vegan restaurant, San Francisco. I'm meeting a teammate of mine for lunch who's vegan. I am not. And I aspire to be more more progressive in that regard. So I know zero vegan restaurants, even though there are many in San Francisco. All right, Mike, thank you so much uh, for sharing your lovely experiences about the company. I really appreciate your time here with me. Thank you so much. Yeah, pleasure, Harshit. Thanks for having me.